Today, we're pleased to be joined by three experts who've been sounding the alarm about the threat from Christian nationalism for years, both in the media and in their books. So we'll start the panel with short presentations from each panelist, followed by some discussion among the panelists, and we'll finish off with a few questions from the audience. So if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A panel in the chat, and I'll pull those out as we go along. So I'm pleased to introduce our three panelists today. Catherine Stewart is a writer who covers religious freedom, controversies over church-state separation, and the political actions of religious groups. Her work has appeared in outlets including the New York Times, The New Republic, and NBC. She's the author of The Good News Club, The Christian Rights Stealth Assault on America's Children, which came out in 2012 and is frightening, and The Power Worshippers, Inside the Dangerous Rise of Religious Nationalism, which came out last year and is even more frightening. So if you want nightmares, <laughs> if you start feeling, if you want to feel like you're a conspiracy theorist because of these shadowy and powerful forces that have a lot of ties in our government, I highly recommend The Power Worshippers. Uh, it's an excellent, well-researched book that will scare the pants off of you. With that, I'll turn it over to Catherine Stewart to start. Thank you so much, Debbie. I uh, really appreciate that uh, terrific introduction. I wanna thank Nick, Sam, everyone else at American Atheists for inviting me to join today's discussion. And I wanna thank my co-panelists, Kelly and Chrissy. I'm really just uh, excited to be in conversation with you. I also wanna thank all of you who've tuned in today. It's been frankly a weird and difficult time for most of us. And I hope all of you and your loved ones are safe. We have faced a lot of challenges this year. We care about one another and we care about our democracy. And that's why we really need to talk about the rise uh, of religious nationalism, this dangerous rise of Christian nationalism in America. So definitions matter. I wanna talk for a minute about what Christian nationalism is and what it is not. The first thing to remember is it is not a religion or even um, it's not a religion properly speaking. It's certainly not Christianity. It's um, a political ideology. Its representatives insist that the foundation of legitimate government is bound up with a very reactionary understanding of the Christian faith. It basically says the United States is founded on the Bible and our country can only really stay, uh, succeed if it stays true to this foundation. And Christian nationalism is also a device for mobilizing and often manipulating large segments of the electorate, large segments of the population, and for, you know, their, the, the aim is to concentrate uh, power in the hands of, of a new elite. Now, I want to say something else about what the movement is not. It's not just about evangelicals. Uh, certainly, it includes a lot of evangelicals, but it excludes a lot of evangelicals, too, including a number of white evangelicals and most evangelicals of color. And it includes representatives of a variety of both Protestant and non-Protestant religion, uh, ultra-conservative Catholics, a cohort of ultra-conservative Catholics uh, in particular become a critical element of the movement. And the movement even derives support from individuals who do not identify as Christian at all. So religious nationalism, it makes use of religion, it sort of exploits religion, but it's not just trying to achieve religious, cultural, or social aims. It's really trying to achieve political power. And there's some aspects of this uh, framing of the movement that I think are not sufficiently appreciated. So I wanna draw attention to them here. Um, people often characterize the movement as being, you know, the consequence of rapid social changes in the 1960s and beyond that shocked a lot of uh, conservative religious folks who have since uh, sort of uh, concentrated as a right-wing voting bloc were determined to prosecute the culture wars and claim victory on a number of hot button issues like uh, abortion or LGBT equality and things or issues and things like that. So that's sort of the background narrative. But what I want to tell you is it's deeply flawed. It really um, is a mischaracterization of the movement. And so today in order to sort of get more of an understanding, I want to convey four general points. The first is that the movement was not created as a sort of spontaneous uprising from the ground up. It's not a bottom up movement. It's a top down movement. It's leadership driven. It's not driven by the rank and file. And when you're talking about the rank and file, you're talking about um, a, a large number of people with a wide range of different interests and ideas and backgrounds. 
And a substantial number of them do not explicitly support anything like a theocracy. They don't really, when they vote to end abortion or when they say they're trying to, um, you know, uh, America's founders, the so-called Christian nation, they aren't explicitly aiming for major fundamental changes in the way, way our government is run. They really are kind of making a st statement about their own identity and what they value in themselves. It's, uh, Christian nationalism is is really working uh, on the level of the rank and file as a kind of identity politics. So their identity may be Christian nationalist, but only in a loose way. But when we're talking about the leaders of the movement, it's a different story. Their vision involves a lot more power for themselves and for their networks and for the political leaders that they support. And many are looking forward to a time when only Christians and their approved versions of the religion are in charge of all major areas of government and society. And they also are working toward a time when they can rely on government for two things. Number one, a constant flow of taxpayer money, <laughs> a lot of their activity and sort of a uh, sort of uh, pushing of this narrative of religious freedom is really aimed for uh, increasing the flow of public money in their direction. But they also want policies that privilege um, their approved versions of faith. You know, the sort of uh, those with the sort of correct conservative views of faith are privileged in law and in society. A second point, and I don't want to speak too long, so I'm going to try and do this quickly. Um, but this is really important. It's related to the first point was that, is that the strength of the movement is really in its dense organizational infrastructure. The movement consists of a, um, a loosely interconnect, interconnected network of right wing policy groups, legal advocacy groups, networking groups, um, legislative initiatives, very sophisticated data initiatives um, and operations, uh, a vast sort of far right um, propaganda sphere, I should say, like media and messaging platforms, all working together for common political aims. So the movement's greatest asset is its infrastructure. Um, and uh, a third point I want to make is that the movement is politically driven. The social and cultural stuff is a consequence of that, not the other way around. And in fact, in a way, the politics has not really changed to match the religion, but the religion and theology has actually changed to match the politics. So I want to give you an example. Uh, the most obvious example of that is the abortion issue. I think a lot of people walk around with the idea that the religious right was created with the legalization of abortion, and many religious right, right leaders would like us to believe that, but it, it's exactly the opposite. The abortion issue was actually created as the issue is, it is today to unite uh, and ignite the new movement. Um, when Roe versus Wade was passed, let's remember that most Protestant Republicans supported it. The Southern Baptist Convention passed resolutions in 90, uh, 71 and 74, affirming, affirming abortion law liberalization. Ronald Reagan, of course, passed the nation's most uh, liberal abortion law, 67. Even Barry Goldwater, who is a great conservative hero, supported abortion law um, liberalization, at least early in his career. This was viewed as a Catholic issue by most Protestant Republicans. Um, but even within Catholicism, it was often articulated, the abortion issue was articulated at the time within co con the context of other policies, some of which were actually uh, intended to aid the poor and vulnerable, um, uh, some of which were progressive, others were not. But the, the issue did not reliably divide Catholic Protestants from Catholic Democrats. So that's really the important point here. I mean, even um, Billy Graham said, um, you know, I just I disagree with the Catholic stance. I believe in Planned Parenthood. Billy Graham said that. <laughs> but um, it was only later that a group of activists, including Paul Weirich, Phyllis Schlafly, Richard Vigory, Howard Phillips, a whole bunch of folks that called themselves the New Right, they felt the Republican Party had become too soft on uh, communism, too liberal. They were really upset uh, that the IRS was starting to look at the uh, tax status of segregated schools, racially segregated schools. You've got to remember a lot of these sort of, they call them segregation academies, sprung up in the South after school de desegregation. And they were really upset that the IRS was starting to say, why are we subsidizing these schools? We're subsidizing the segregation, that's not okay. So they really needed an issue to unite their new movement, but stop the tax on segregation, they knew it's just <laughs> too ugly a slogan 
to uh, to pursue, and and they like considered a number of issues. And they settled on abortion as the issue to unite their new movement. Um, Phyllis Schlafly actually published a book about that in 2016 called How the Republican Party Became Pro-Life. It took a lot of work, but what it really shows is that the sort of pro-life religion that we see today is a modern creation and it was created for political purposes. The last general point I wanna make um, before I turn the panel over to my wonderful co-panelists is that the movement has always been profoundly anti-democratic and pro-authoritarian at all levels. And I think it's naive to think that it's just another set of voices in the public square or just another group seeking representation within a broader democracy. This is an authoritarian movement. It's deeply hostile to the idea of democracy and representative government. We saw this in their slavish support for Donald Trump, who they compared with biblical kings like King Cyrus and King David. Um, look, here's the thing about kings, they don't have to play by the rules. They're the law unto themselves. And they're not the leaders of democracies. We see it also in their commitment to minority rules through voter suppression and gerrymandering. Today we have 200, I think the latest uh, count actually 361 bills in 47 states, all intending to restrict voting rights, disproportionately affecting voters of color. We certainly saw it through their promotion of the big lie of the stone election. So, you know, the question is, where do we go from here? I think a significant answer uh, right now uh, involves protecting the right to vote. Uh, the religious right is a minority of the population, but it, they punch above their political weight for two reasons. Number one, because they vote in disproportionate numbers. All that machinery of the movement is very much focused on getting people out to vote in unity. And number two, they're determined to suppress the votes that they don't like, that, that oppose their agenda, and they know they can't win in a fair fight. So that's why they work so hard to suppress the vote. Separation of church and state has to be a central part of any response uh, to this uh, challenge that we're facing. And um, I wanna say quickly that I think the part that matters most is not necessarily symbolic. Often we think of separation of church and state in terms of like crosses on public lands and prayers in public meetings. And that stuff is important too, but there's a much more important fusion of church and state happening at a structural and economic level through the courts, which is where the religious right is focusing much of its efforts. And also, you know, where we're handing over significant amounts of taxpayer money to uh, religious networks to perform essential social services, while they also demand, along with that public money, a right to discriminate against people of other faiths, against women, against LGBT Americans, uh, against the non-religious, all of that represents an invisible, uh, invisible fusion of church and state that should be of great concern. So, you know, the rise of Christian nationalism is one of those challenges that has to be approached at multiple levels. It's important to remember that their vision, the vision of a nation founded upon hierarchies enshrined in purportedly biblical law is the foundation of a weak society and not a strong one. So the good news is that Americans, religious and non-religious alike, are really coming to terms with the threat that this movement represents to our democracy and are organizing to meet the challenge. I, for one, am very encouraged by what's possible. So thank you so much, and I really look forward to hearing from my fellow panelists. You did it again. <laughs> I got goosebumps from terror. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I hear you speak, Catherine, I, I learn some other facet about um, the structure and threat from Christian nationalism. So thanks, thanks for that. <laughs> and thank you. Thank you for the work you're doing, too, and uh, for participating in this conference. Um, I'm sure our audience also really appreciates this information. And I'm excited for the discussion part. And from there, we'll go on with uh, Kelly Baker who was new to me, actually, I first learned, I think I first saw the name Kelly Baker and I was like, who is this person who I should know? <laughs> in an article, it might have been in the New York Times after the uh, after January 6th. And it was, there was so much good information in there. I was like, how has this person not been on my radar yet? What an error, I must amend that. <laughs> Maybe we should invite this person to speak at our convention. So I'm really glad that we connected with you, Kelly. So some background on Kelly. Kelly is an essayist, historian, and journalist 
who covers religion, higher education, gender, labor, motherhood, and popular culture for outlets including the New York Times, The Atlantic, The Washington Post, and others. She has a PhD in American religious history, and her scholarship encompasses a variety of topics including religion, popular culture, religion and racial hatred, and I just lost my place, apocalypticism, <laughs> Religion and gender and horror, of course, which now I'm feeling overlaps with some of the other categories quite well. She's written several books, including the award-winning Gospel According to the Klan, the KKK's Appeal to Protestant America, 1915 to 1930, which came out in 2011. And she'll be talking some about the history and the fact that this Christian nationalism just didn't come out of nowhere. So take it away, Kelly. Thank you. I really appreciate y'all having me. I'm very excited about this. Um, so I am the historian on the panel, um, which means that I'm going to look at three different things and I'm going to try to keep this brief so we can move on to Chrissy and some good discussion uh, a little bit later. So there are three things I want to pay attention to today. Um, one is what we talk about when we talk about white supremacist movements. Um, the other is looking backward um, to the Klan to think about the history of white Christian nationalism and how much longer that history is than people assume that it actually was. Um, if we paid attention to media coverage, we would assume that this is something that kind of popped up in uh, 2016, and that's very much not the case. And then the last thing I want to pay attention to is the kind of stories that um, contemporary white Christian nationalists and the Klan tell about what American history is. So how they understand um, the kind of America that we're in and the kind of America that they want. So those are kind of the guiding principles today that I'm going to look at. So first and foremost, I should say that um, I came to this topic by wanting to pay attention to white supremacist movements. Um, I have a PhD in religious studies, and I was interested in those intersections between white supremacist movements um, that a lot of folks assumed were secular and were not religious, and um, religious movements that I had encountered as someone from rural North Florida, um, so that I had seen some of these very exclusive politics and ideas in practice. And I kind of wanted to see how these work together in some kind of way. So the first thing that I would say about this is that when we think about white supremacy, there's a way in which um, folks assume this is about prejudice or belief or something like this. And one of the things that I try to do in my work is to talk about white supremacy as a structure, right? Uh, that white supremacy is embedded in American institutions, it's embedded in American government, um, in our culture, in our legal system. So that when we talk about white supremacy here, I'm talking about white supremacists who are often coded as extremists, um, though I don't really like that for lots of reasons, as you'll see a little bit later as I go into this. Um, but I'm also talking about it as a system that we all inhabit. Uh, so that when folks are trying to say that white supremacists are extremists, they're ignoring the larger umbrella of the fact that in American culture, we all exist under a white supremacist system. Uh, these folks are just the most dramatic and direct and obvious about this in some sort of way. So before I move to our historical example, one of the things I wanna note is that white supremacy and white Christian nationalism in particular um, is something that's important to track because according to the Southern Poverty Law Center, during the first three years of the Trump presidency, um, it was the historical high for hate groups when usually when um, folks that are sympathetic to them that are in power, there's a decline. So with the Trump presidency, there was actually an increase and then a little bit of a decline in 2020. And one of the points they make and the points that I try to make in my work is that a decline in white supremacy our white supremacist movements by the number of groups that we have doesn't necessarily mean a decline in white supremacist engagement, ideas, or in folks that have adopted white Christian nationalism. So one of the mistakes that often happens in this kind of work is that people assume that we should just track uh, groups and their membership, when instead what I would encourage us to do is to think about how those ideas live in mainstream culture. 
and how they motivate not only the folks that we kind of label white Christian nationalists, but as Catherine pointed out, are a part of our kind of mainstream political ideology and rhetoric. So we have to kind of pay attention to those two in tandem. So that white nationalist groups now are actually more diffuse um, and they're harder to track. Thank you, social media and the internet for making this the case. Um, whereas in my historical research with the Klan, you could talk about particular groups, right? And you could talk about particular chapters and members and this sort of thing. It's harder to map now. Uh, this is important partially because there have been a couple of reports that have come out recently that talk about the threat of domestic terrorism, usually by white nationalists or white supremacists, um, it's coded here, or militia movements that is becoming an increasing threat. Um, ironically, there was a report from the FBI that came out just before the January 6th insurrection that pointed to this problem, that this has become, um, was gonna become a bigger problem than it was in 2020 because these folks felt more and more emboldened by Trump's actions and the Trump presidency than they had previously. So that there was a concern that in 2021, right, where we are right now, there would be more of this violence. And that insurrection on January 6th showed us some of this, right? We were able to see it play out in real time. Um, I don't know about all of you, but I kind of sat in front of my laptop and watched this um, as it continued um, while like my 12 year old was also popping in and doing this, right? And so was my partner. So that we're all watching this in real time. And one of the things that I would point to there is that there was a lot of media shock and like, scratching of heads about all the Christian symbols that appeared, right, as folks are storming the Capitol. So that there are crosses, right, there are people talking about this, um, that there was all this Christian symbolism and that this rhetoric around this that people weren't sure what to do with. And so one of the points of my larger historical work is to point out that Christianity goes hand in hand with white nationalism and white supremacy in American culture. That these are very hard to separate, even though people try to. Um, and especially when it comes to white supremacy, there's an attempt to say that white supremacy is somehow not attached to religion. Um, or if it's attached to religion, that religion is now it's like propaganda, right? It's not really Christianity, something like this. Um, and one of the things that I would kind of push us to think about is to think about those intersections, right? How nationalism and white supremacy and Protestant, white Protestant Christianity work together in American culture now and in the past. So in my historical work, one of the things that I paid attention to was the 1920s Klan, which was the most mainstream example of the Ku Klux Klan in American history. They had millions of members. Um, they were in the 48 continental states. So they were in the North, the South, the Midwest, right? Um, the Southwest that you could find them everywhere. Uh, and th this was a movement that really combined some strands that had already appeared in American culture. Um, one of the things that I like to point out is that white Christian nationalism is a feature in American history. It's not a bug, right? So there's a way in which people want to say this is an anomaly. How did we get here? Um, we got here when we got here, right? So um, that this goes very far back and that we can see this play out in a number of different movements. And the Klan was just my case study for this. Uh, so with the 1920s Klan, they made this explicit in a way that it might not have been explicit in movements after and movements before. So that the goal of the Klan was to combine Christianity, um, patriotism, and white supremacy. And they didn't play around about this. There's a way in which um, contemporary groups try to like not talk about themselves as white supremacists. The Klan was okay with this. Like they had no problem um, agreeing to this, this is part of their language, was not an issue that was there. So that the 1920s Klan becomes a way that we can kind of interpret the present and see how all those worked together. Um, and that I really think we should. So I wanna show an image before I move on to one of my other points here um, that I have. So we're gonna attempt this and see what happens. All right. Uh, there we go. So
So this image that I have here is an image um, from 1924, and it is an image um, of the Klan planks for the year. So each year in um, the Klan newspaper, the Imperial Nighthawk, they would talk about what their goals were, right, for the next year. And so you can see in this image, there's a Klansman on the horse. He's holding the fiery cross, um, very kind of typical image for the Klan. And around the top of the image, it has all the different planks and the things that they wanted to pay attention to. Um, so there are a couple that, well, a few that I want to mention. So one of them is restricted immigration, which sounds very familiar to now. Um, they were pro-law enforcement as long as law enforcement was on their side. Um, they were for better schools, um, which here was code for public schools instead of Catholic schools because they were deeply concerned about Catholics in the 20s. Uh, clean politics, which is, I don't even know what to say about this, except that um, for them, clean politics would be white Protestant Christians in charge <laughs> and not questioned. Uh, that they were interested in what they called militant Protestantism. So uh, they have a very martial sense of what Protestantism is, and you can kind of get a sense of this because they understood themselves as knights. Um, allegiance to the flag is another, which is about patriotism. So they had all of these pieces that they wanted us to pay attention to, right? And that is pretty common. And you can also see how this played out with um, the other things that they are doing, right? Like these, these are attached um, to each other. So the other piece of this that I want us to kind of think about and we can bring up in discussion is that um, I'm a historian, so I'm a nerd about narrative and about the kind of stories we tell about the American past and the American present and, and also the American future. And one of the things that's so interesting to me when we pair up contemporary white Christian nationalism and the white Christian nationalism of the past that I've previously studied is to think about what stories they tell about what America is. So when they're telling stories about national history, when they are thinking about patriotism, right? When they're doing these sorts of things, what is the America that they're conjuring, right? Like, what do they want this to look like? And so for the Klan in the 1920s, one of the ways they do this is that they would tell a selective history in which they would start with Puritans, right? To so start with white people landing, you know, um, in the United States, uh, they would ignore the genocide of indigenous peoples. Uh, they would skip the whole thing of slavery, right? Like they just kind of shoot past it. Um, and so they would tell this very clear story of white Protestants founding the nation, making it better, being the center of this, right? Um, and that everybody else kind of gets shunted to the side and they don't pay attention to them. Uh, and so America, in their tellings, becomes a nation of white Christians for white Christians. And everyone else who's not a white Christian becomes an enemy of the state, right? So people of color, for them, this was a variety of religious movements, too, that they just understood that all of these people were a threat and that they had to react to this threat um, because they were deeply concerned about how the character of American culture would change um, in different time periods because of shifting demographics, um, but also in reactions to um, the rights that other peoples gained, right? Uh, so that the concern that if other people gained rights, then they would somehow lose them or lose power. So these threats to the nation are still very much a part of the contemporary narrative, right? That we see this way in which people want to sort of mythologize American history. They still want to do this thing where white people are centered. Um, and one of the things that I think is important to know about this is that, is that these stories, these clan narratives, right? Um, and these other white supremacist narratives are the ones that inhabit public school textbooks in places like Florida, where I'm at, or Texas, or these sorts of things. So that these are not stories of just extremists, right? These are stories that are mainstream, that are used, um, and that very much are a part of the culture that we're in. 
so that we have to think about this beyond the sort of labels of extremists and anomaly and think through how Christianity and race and nationalism and exclusion work together in this movement um, if we're going to think about how we're going to counter it and how we're going to work past this. Um, so I think I'll stop there and um, I'm eager to hear what other people have um, for discussion. And so I will just pass it back on to Debbie. Thank you, Kelly. <laughs> Horror background too. It's interesting to think about the through line in American history and that the, the fact that these Christian nationalist, nationalist groups didn't come from nowhere, which again was a, a little bit disappointing to see in some media sources and certainly on social media, the people who were like, um, even in the last four years, but particularly in the last few months, the reaction to some of the uh, events and politics of some people was like, where did this come from? Where did these people live? <laughs> and it's like, have you been paying attention to what exists out there? No, no. It seems like a surprise, like this all of a sudden just popped up sometime in the last three or four years. But no, there's clearly a long history, a lot of history behind this. So I appreciate you sharing some of that. And we'll get into more in the discussion. And our third panelist today is Chrissy Stroop. Uh, Chrissy grew up in central Indiana and Colorado Springs, where she attended evangelical Christian schools that indoctrinated her in alternative facts and mobilized her for the culture wars. And probably considering this background, she went on to receive a PhD in modern Russian history from Stanford, and she's now an outspoken ex-evangelical writer and advocate. She's the co-editor of the essay anthology, Empty the Pews, Stories of Leaving the Church, and she's contributed articles to Religion Dispatches, The Boston Globe, The Conversationalist, Playboy, and other outlets. Chrissy is also the creator of several viral hashtags, including Empty the Pews, and I should say, hashtag Empty the Pews, and hashtag <laughs> <laughs> Expose Christian Schools. Thank you for joining us, Chrissy. Uh, well, thank you all so much for inviting me. Thank you for the introduction and for moderating, Debbie. And I also want to express my thanks to... Uh, Nick and Sam and Tom and Allison and uh, everyone at American Atheist. It's always a pleasure to work with all of you. And I want to thank uh, my fellow panelists, um, Kelly and Catherine. Uh, Catherine, I've had the pleasure of meeting in person before. Kelly, I haven't really, well, we kind of like very, br very briefly met once at a conference. But it's really great to get to work with both of you because I very much admire uh, both of your work. And um, I think that this um, presentation that I'm going to give now can also provide some um, interesting context for um, what both of you have said uh, about Christian nationalism, um, what it is now, how it organizes politically, where it comes from. And um, I am also a trained historian, as, uh, as Debbie said. Uh, my focus was actually on modern Russian history, looking at modern Christian intellectuals in the late Russian empire. And then they mostly ended up uh, outside the Soviet Union if they weren't dead, um, you know, in, in the 1920s as part of this Russian diaspora. And this is actually a strand that a lot of people haven't really thought about, but uh, they helped cultivate a Christian understanding of anti-communism that became very uh, powerful during the Cold War and actually influenced European and American theologians and political actors. So I'm not really going to get into that today, but I am going to say my historical studies and my Christian right background ended up kind of coming full circle. And um, that Cold War moment is, of course, one important crystallization of uh, Christian nationalism in American history, uh, which helped pave the way for the rise of the Christian right as we know it today, which um, Catherine was, was talking about. Um, as part of, you know, the creation of the Christian right, you have the rise of the Christian schooling movements, and along with that homeschooling, though that takes off a little bit later, um, you start to see Christian schools founded in the, in the 1960s, and in, in that instance, you know, those early Christian schools, many of them are founded explicitly as segregation academies. Uh, of course, up through the 1950s, most of American public education was really quite Protestant uh, in character. And of course it was, it was racially segregated. Uh, and so, you know, as, as uh, you know, Catherine was saying, it wasn't about abortion where the Christian right ultimately came from. It really was about this long history of uh, white supremacism, which as Kelly pointed out, is just intimately tied up with um, 
white Christianity in, in the United States. And I, uh, I want to say I agree with Kelly that you cannot separate uh, those two things as distinct in, in that particular mix, right? It's not, it's not fake Christianity. It's not just political Christianity or politicized Christianity when we're talking about Christian nationalism. It is Christian. It certainly didn't come from nowhere. And um, to my mind, there's, there's no clear cut distinction uh, where, where we can say, well, there's no bright line where uh, religion ends and politics begins. Religion is about navigating uh, values and uh, a certain uh, sort of community, communally mediated, let's say, understanding of truth. Uh, and that community and cultural element is, is very important. And so uh, religion is always political. Um, the question is, what kind of politics does it have? And that, so to say that religion is always political doesn't mean to say that uh, religious, uh, the politics of a particular religious community uh, have to be detrimental or anti-democratic. But the politics of Christian nationalism, of course, is anti-democratic. As Catherine said, it is very authoritarian. Um, and, and I think one way to look at that is to see how kids are socialized in, in Christian schools and in Christian homeschooling. And you can see just how very uh, anti-pluralist it is. Um, to that end, I've, I've got a few slides I want to show you. So I'm going to go ahead and switch over to screen sharing now. And uh, hopefully that will work as smoothly as it worked. Uh, with Kelly. So, um, okay, I think I have to hit share entire screen. Wait, why is this not working? Application window, is this going to work? Uh, let's try that. Did that work? Okay, I think that worked. <laughs> uh, so, all right, I'm now going to um, put these slides on, um, you know, slideshow mode, and um, hopefully this will just, oops, what just happened? Uh, okay, so, okay. Um, and so, Hopefully you can kind of read the slides. I hope the print is not too too small, but I'm going to read uh, some some things as I go through. Uh, I, I mean, if there's text on the slide, I will I will read it just to make sure everyone uh, it has access to that. And of course, I'm going to supplement the slides as well uh, with both some anecdotes and some some data to the extent that we have it on this. Um, but let's start with some visuals. So. Uh, you look at the top left visual there, of course, it's a scene from the January 6th insurrection. And, and right there, you know, with the Trump fuck your feelings flags, sorry, am I allowed to say that? Uh, and uh, the American flag, you have this Christian flag. Whenever I bring up the Christian flag, uh, I, I often have people respond with, there's a Christian flag. Uh, and, you know, then they're really surprised to hear that I grew up in elementary school pledging to that flag, after the pledge to the American flag, and before the pledge to the Bible. Um, so, you know, when we look at the imagery from the January 6th insurrection, and we see these Christian symbols and these uh, jingoistic symbols, uh, and just American symbols all mixed up together, that was, was nothing new to me as a 1980 baby uh, raised in uh, evangelical churches and Christian schools. And so, as Debbie was saying, you know, a lot of um, people were shocked first, you know, how could these white evangelicals support Trump? For four long years, I was telling everybody, that wasn't surprising. And, and nobody wanted to understand why. I mean, think piece after think piece, right, on how can these evangelicals with their moralizing politics support Donald Trump? Um, yeah, that's, it's, it's really not a hard question. He did exactly what they wanted. So they excused all his, his vulgarity and his sexual assaults, which they also cover up in their own schools and churches. Uh, but anyway, that's um, getting a bit off topic. Uh, and you probably also all remember seeing this big Jesus 2020 banner. Uh, Jesus 2020 was also among the slogans that were seen at the insurrection on January 6th. Um, and so here in the lower uh, right corner, you see just a screenshot from Religion Dispatches, an article that I wrote back in September uh, of 2020 with the headline, Christian right claims to be above politics are unbelievable. And I focused on these Jesus 2020 signs that actually came out of a particular uh, Baptist church in the South. And um, 
you know, there was a little bit of coverage of this in like, uh, you know, local Alabama media. Um, but I kind of picked up on that. And I noticed that in interviews with, uh, you know, local news, the, uh, the people who created these Jesus 2020 signs were saying that this is, oh, this is apolitical. Um, this is just about our morality and how we all need to trust in Jesus. And that you, so as soon as they get into that, we all, they're already being anti-pluralist and very political, right? So a lot of what you see with the Christian right, uh, when they claim to be apolitical, is they're actually trying to make a power grab by, uh, by claiming moral authority and that morality is above politics. And so I'm honestly just kind of proud of the fact that I drew attention to this in September uh, and, you know, in several months later, I mean, I'm not, I'm not proud of the fact that it did show up at the January 6th insurrection, but I'm proud of the fact that I sort of noted it before it showed up there and said that this is not apolitical and it didn't really surprise me that this slogan showed up at uh, the January 6th insurrection. And I think that moment is helping to wake up the American public a little bit. Uh, you know, we're starting to see much more uh, serious scrutiny and, and even at least mild criticism of white evangelicals and the Christian right in, in the major press. And I think that's a good thing. And that's something that I've been trying to press for for years by highlighting the stories of ex-evangelicals and uh, arguing that we should be considered stakeholders in our uh, discussions of Christianity in the United States. Also by uh, getting my own writing out wherever I can, uh, cultivating relationships with journalists and to borrow a religious metaphor, I think that's finally starting to, to bear some fruit. Uh, obviously I cannot claim anything like all the credit for that. Honestly, Donald Trump gets a lot of the credit, but uh, hopefully I helped a bit. And I'm just glad to see that we're finally, very belatedly, maybe starting to take this seriously um, in the American press, though um, network news and cable news is still very far behind on this. But anyway, let's, um, let's move on a bit from this. So uh, in, after the January 6th insurrection, I, I wrote this article for Religion Dispatches with the headline, where were they radicalized? No answer is complete without addressing evangelical churches and schooling. And I just discussed a little bit in this article of how Christian nationalism is instilled through socialization and indoctrination, uh, in particularly in evangelical and fundamentalist Christian curricula that are used by Christian homeschoolers uh, and in Christian schools. There have been some great, there was a great deep dive done into this some time back by Rebecca Klein for Huffington Post. Uh, where she actually got data on uh, the use of particular textbooks in uh, voucher-funded schools, textbooks published by Bob Jones and Abeka, um, and, which are particularly you know, Christian nationalist and racist curricula. They, um, they talk about slavery as black immigration, uh, or they just gloss over it. They say positive things about apartheid South Africa and at least they used to, maybe they've sanitized this a bit since, but say positive things about apartheid itself. Um, I think they still strongly hint in that direction based on what I've read. Um, you know, they, they also teach you things like uh, the Civil War was about states' rights and these Civil War generals, particularly Andrew Jackson, were just the most pious God-fearing men and we should admire them. Uh, so yeah, it's a very twisted uh, historical narrative Part of the socialization here as well uh, has to do with just the, the symbolism and, and the rituals that you practice in these schools. And so, as I said, um, in your typical uh, evangelical Protestant or fundamentalist, Baptist, Calvinist, uh, whatever, sometimes also Lutheran or even Episcopalian, you might say three pledges at the beginning of the, the day to the American flag first, then the Christian flag, and then to the Bible. Um, and that was certainly my experience growing up. But I want to actually read you quickly these uh, pledges to the Christian flag in the Bible that we said, because you might be unfamiliar. So the pledge to the Christian flag goes, I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for whose kingdom it stands, one Savior crucified, risen and coming again with life and liberty for all who believe. So you know, even apart from the fact that in these kind of evangelical environments, they tell you that 
you know, it's your job to go out and convert people that the world would be a much better place if everyone were a Christian. Um, this pledge itself is very anti-pluralist, right? Uh, this is a very political understanding of the kingdom of God. Uh, so you have that kingdom language. And then, you know, it says Christ is coming back with life and liberty, not for all, but for all who believe. Uh, and then the pledge to the Bible. I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path and will hide its words in my heart that I might not sin against God. So maybe that doesn't sound as explicitly anti-pluralist, but uh, you take the three things together and I think they're sort of building on a hierarchy of authority, right? Country, God slash religion, uh, and then the Bible as sort of the way that you understand that. But obviously that's inflected through a very specific American evangelical Protestant reading of the Bible. Uh, by the way, there is another version of the Pledge to the Christian Flag that has a nicer sounding ending, something about brotherhood. I forget exactly how it goes. That is used in more liberal Christian environments sometimes. But uh, I think the whole thing is, the whole pledging thing is weird. And But of course, we got the worst uh, version of the pledge. Uh, it was interesting that this article that I wrote for Religion Dispatches actually got spread around pretty widely. And uh, so Christianity Today, which is kind of a flagship uh, magazine for what I call quote unquote respectable evangelicals, felt the need to respond. And what you're seeing in a lot of the messaging now uh, from more PR savvy uh, evangelicals is that they're trying to distance themselves from, from Christian nationalism, uh, at least from the term Christian nationalism and calling it idolatry and so forth. Uh, so this commentator, uh, she's also an editor at The Week and a columnist at Christianity Today, Bonnie Christian, uh, wrote this article responding to mine and it was very sort of testy and defensive, but she basically conceded one point that uh, schools should not be having all these pledges. Uh, however, she then created a false equivalence by saying that, well, public schools also require pledges to the flag, to the American flag, and that's bad. So both public schools and Christian schools instill nationalism. So at the end of the day, Christian schools are still better. Uh, and of course, her article did not mention the words white or race or racism even once. She glossed over everything else. And this is a common move that you'll see uh, PR savvy and quote unquote respectable folks on the Christian right try try to make, they'll try to deflect uh, with with false equivalence and whataboutism, and they'll focus on maybe one thing and, and then say that the rest of your article is basically wrong. But I talked about a lot more here than just symbols like the pledges, although I think that you know uh, this kind of pledging, particularly those three pledges in a row, is not is not good for children. I mean, I agree with her that I don't think public schools should have the pledge to the flag as a de facto required thing. Technically, of course, the Supreme Court says you can't force anyone to say it, but that's violated all the time. Um, but anyway, in the Christian schools, it's all, it's explicitly God and country. And, um, you know, thinking back now to Catherine's presentation, I think I'm a little less kind to the rank and file than she is, having, having been the rank and file, but also getting the kind of uh, elite Christian education um, that puts you on the track to being either, you know, an active culture warrior, like someone who would work for Liberty Council or Alliance Defending Freedom, or someone who can make a lot of money and fund those sort of things. I call that the elite culture warrior track. Um, it, it, there is definitely a sort of top-down understanding of authority on the Christian right, but the organization runs deep. And in the pews, in the Christian schools, people are usually enthusiastic about it. Um, and let me tell you a little bit more just about how Christian nationalism expressed itself in my experience being uh, educated at Heritage Christian School in Indianapolis, a school that brags about uh, its college placement rate, although it funnels most of its students into evangelical colleges and universities, um, brags about getting higher uh, test scores, SAT scores than the surrounding Indianapolis public schools. Um, although of course it's a very self-selecting sort of environment. Uh, and obviously they do a lot to prepare kids for the test and the public schools are underfunded, but they like to brag about that. In other words, they, they want kids to go, to go to college. They want kids to be economically successful in order to pursue uh, precisely these Christian nationalist goals. So how else did I see that uh, at Heritage Christian and also at um, Colorado, Springs, Colorado Springs Christian School 
uh, during the couple of years that my family lived out there. Um, well, at Heritage, they used to have talent shows that uh, ended with Lee Greenwood audience sing-alongs. We would sing his terrible song, uh, God Bless the USA. It's so bad. You know, I'm proud to be an American. Yeah, I'm not going to go on. But uh, anyway, we also had emblazoned on one of the walls in the elementary school a part of Psalm 3312 that said, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And uh, what that actually meant was we had to make our country obedient to God, which mostly meant, you know, putting, quote unquote, prayer back in schools that is required, uh, sanctioned, state sanctioned prayer in public schools is what they want, but also banning abortion and uh, keeping queer people from having rights. It's a sort of politics of providentialism, I call it, right, that God will punish you if you as a nation don't do what he wants and he will protect you if you do what he wants. We have this language of the biblical worldview that comes out of Christian reconstructionism. We didn't call ourselves Christian reconstructionists. We didn't call ourselves Christian nationalists, uh, but but we were, you know, we used the same language. Um, and I know that as, as Kelly said, some of these ideas are also taught in, in public schools. And uh, that's because conservative Christians who are white supremacists, even though they won't admit it in many cases, do have a lot of influence throughout the United States, particularly in certain states, localities, and school districts. But in Christian schools, they, they dial it up to 11. Um, we had conservative politicians who would speak in our required chapel services sometimes. In high school, uh, they actually took us on field trips to uh, these conventions that were uh, for an organization called Citizens Concerned for the Constitution. It has since rebranded as uh, Advance America, and it bills itself as uh, Indiana's premier pro-homeschooling, pro-Christian schooling, pro-family organization. And uh, pro-family, of course, is a code word there for, you know, uh, they oppose same-sex marriage and they oppose abortion and all of that sort of thing. And then, so we weren't only taken there, as high school juniors and seniors, but we were also mobilized by the Christian school to uh, send their voter guides out to the parents and affiliates of the school. Um, so, and also to give you just a more recent example, I, I happen to know because I talked to other uh, alumni, including very recent alumni, and my mom still teaches at Heritage Christian School in Indi Indianapolis. Um, they sent out a letter to parents uh, urging them to call their senators to oppose the Equality Act. So this kind of just being very political and, and mobilizing and, you know, rallying uh, your people to do these political things and to say that it's basically an imperative of the faith is, is something that very much still happens. Um, so now how common uh, is, is this? How big of an issue is this? So... Uh, here's, okay, well, there's a, this slide is just a, from an essay that I, I recently, well, not recently, I wrote it three years ago, uh, that talks about some of my experience, but here's the data, uh, some of the data. So from that in-depth reporting that I talked about uh, that was done by the Huffington Post, we can extrapolate that there are approximately 2,400 uh, non-Catholic Christian schools in the United States that receive public funding via state voucher and tax credit programs. Uh, so, and that's just the ones that, that take public funding. Um, there may be more, and there are certainly more schools that, that teach these things. I did a little digging to try and see if I could come up with um, more detailed statistics. So I found an organization uh, called CAPE, Council for American Private Education. Uh, it represents a lot of different private school interests, including the Association for Christian Schools International, which is the body that uh, accredits Heritage Christian School. Uh, so according to their data, there are over 5.7 uh, million American students in private schools. And then I looked at the breakdown of that. And uh, from what I could tell from how they broke it down by a uh, specific school affiliation, I would say there's about 10 to 20% of those in these schools who are in what we might call Christian extremist schools. The schools are labeled um, conservative Christian, or uh, Calvinist or Baptist, um, the number, that estimate, which would then, you know, come out to somewhere between five, 
570,000 and 1 million something might even be conservative because I didn't count the Catholic schools at all. And I'm sure that some Catholic schools uh, are indoctrinating children in Christian nationalism, but mostly um, Catholic schools, they, they vary a lot, but they're a little bit more moderate in their approaches to some of these things than the evangelical schools. They don't, for example, tend to teach young earth creationism. Um, I don't think they teach young earth creationism at all, but you do learn young earth creationism uh, even in science class in evangelical Protestant schools. Um, and then about homeschooling, which is also used to instill the same kinds of values and homeschooling programs also tend to mobilize kids for things like anti-abortion protests um, or other political activities. Uh, I wanna read just a brief quote from the sidebar article in uh, American Atheists um, 2020 State of the Secular States report, an article by Andrew Torres uh, titled Homeschooling Law Needs Reform. So Torres writes, the most comprehensive survey data maintained by the Department of Education shows that more than nine out of every 10 homeschooling parents do so out of a stated concern for the environment at public schools and specifically to raise their children with a religious and or moral alternative to that environment. And then Torres also says, since fundamentalist Christians are the overwhelming majority of consumers, even secular homeschooling resources typically water down quote unquote controversial subjects like evolution to market themselves to this religious supermajority. And I know I'm probably out of time, so let me just um, close my slides. Uh, oh yeah, by empty the pews. Um, <laughs> and uh, okay, how do I stop sharing <laughs> my screen? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, uh, where do I do that? Oh, am I back? I'm back. Uh, yeah, so sorry about that. Um, I just want to say that probably the most important Christian right lobby you've never heard of is the Homeschool Legal Defense Association, which uh, started working very uh, ultimately successfully to deregulate uh, homeschooling from the 1980s. Okay, sorry for taking too much time. <laughs> That was great information. I took notes. And Thero, a good look at schools in particular and the way that <laughs> the way that they were kick. I went to Catholic school not that long ago. But <laughs> you know, when I growing up in the East Coast, when I think about religious education, that's the first thing that comes to mind is Catholic schools. And they're relatively mild. We didn't pledge to a weird Catholic flag or kiss, you know, pictures of the Pope <laughs> or anything like that. And so hearing these stories about Christian flag pledges and, you know, singing in assemblies, like I thought it was weird as an adult not being Catholic to look and see like Mary statues everywhere at Catholic schools and Catholic churches. It's not nearly as weird <laughs> as some of the activities <laughs> that you're talking about. Um, by the way, the data from CAPE says that over 50%, I think it's 53%, if I remember correctly, of American private schools are Catholic schools. Yeah, that's an interesting uh, shift. Of course, some of the discussion recently has been on um, homeschooling under the pandemic, people pulling their kids out of schools, of course, race being a part of that. But I wanted to focus on a, a something else that came up throughout a lot of this. We've talked about narratives and power and structure and people. What are some of the tools that Christian nationalists can use in the media to spread their message, and how do we combat that? Anyone can go. <laughs> Maybe Catherine. Sure. Um, I mean, the, one of the reasons the movement is as successful as it is in uniting uh, large numbers of people to vote for the hyper-conservative uh, political candidates that the movement favors is through their media. It's uh, very well funded. There are, you know, there's a kind of vast far right uh, messaging sphere uh, platforms like from, you know, Fox News and 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 right from that and have Breitbart and uh, EWT. I mean, a lot of different sort of platforms that work to sort of unite to uh, unite this sort of vast number of uh, Americans and get them sort of um, convinced that. You know there are certain issues that that should uh, they should consider when they you know when they uh, vote. 
And I mean, the movement leaders know very well if you can get people to vote on just a few issues, you can control their vote. So they you know, work to push those narratives and they're very careful about which narratives they push. I guess the question about how to uh, fight back uh, on that sort of far right messaging sphere is, is, is challenging. There's like no easy answer. I think that uh, the more accurate stories uh, and narratives are out there. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, folks who are sort of opposed to the politics of conquest and division that that movement represents are not about to sort of boil down all of the complex problems of the world to uh, uh, one or two incredibly binary issues with a yes or no answer. So, um, you know, it's really important to tell stories. I think, um, you know, I loved uh, the... Uh, thing that Chrissy had uh, right next to her book, which is like, what was it, Chrissy? Stories of Power, or is that what it said? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Stories of Power. Of power. Yes, and yes. people often understand stories through character. And that's certainly how I, I sort of tried to incorporate that type of storytelling in my book, The Power Worshipper, mm -hmm, focused mm -hmm. on some of the, what I thought were most, some of the most intriguing movement leaders, uh, but there are frankly so many that sort of tell the story of how they understand um, their activism. And uh, yeah, I, it's, I didn't mean to interrupt there, but a little bit to stories have power. I think that's a critical point, right? We all live through narratives, which is why the right tries so hard to control the messaging and control the narrative. And one way this plays out for former Christian school kids and homeschool kids who don't agree with the ideology that we were raised with is that we mostly don't have a voice in the public sphere. And so, you know, I've been, I've been advocating for our stories to be heard, uh, facilitating hashtag campaigns. I'm not the only one doing that to help those stories to be heard. Occasionally that gets media coverage. And ultimately, you know, if you can change the way this is discussed in the media, if you can establish more voices in there, you can, you can make better policy outcomes possible. That's a very long-term thing, but that has sort of been my focus. And that's also what Empty the Fuse is about. It's a co-edited volume of essays. My friend Lauren O'Neill and I wrote one each and we wrote the introduction. The rest of it is a very diverse group of people from conservative Christian backgrounds talking about their experiences because they change hearts and minds. People interested in someone's sore uh, how they're living, you know, secularism, you can, you can undermine the Christian rights messaging. I would just want to point out too that I think um, that I think narrative and story is super important, and I think that there's also a way in which um, social media allows people that are studying white Christian nationalism to break down the media coverage and to sort of put their expertise out there. Um, I find Twitter very useful for this, where when there's media coverage about white Christian nationalism, I can come in and say here's what they said, right? Here are the things that we should pay attention to in this, right? Um, because it is the case that, as Catherine has pointed out, and as Chrissy has pointed out, um, that these folks are very good at media. They've been very good at media historically. They have a brand, they have polish, they have public relations. Um, and I think some journalists get caught up in that instead of what they're saying or what they're doing and these sorts of things. So I think when we can use um, those kinds of tools to us to reach a different audience and do those things, uh, that helps out too, right? To give that education piece, but also to emphasize those competing narratives, like Chrissy said, but also competing narratives about what American history looks like. Um, and so for me, that's where a lot of my like Twitter threads come in, right? Is it's like, oh, someone said this about American history. Well, actually, right, which is what historians love to say, but you know, that you can kind of show that and, and do that kind of piece of the work as well. Oh, and can I just say quickly to um, one of Kelly's points, well, more going back to her imagery, the most common Christian school mascots that I've encountered uh, are knights, crusaders, uh, and then lions and, and eagles. But the knight and crusader imagery is very clan imagery. That's, that's not coincidental. Mm. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people asked when uh, in all of your presentations, there was a lot of discussion in the chat and some questions from the audience about 
schools. And then Chrissy, you gave a lot of information about Christian schools, but there were some questions too about public schools. And on the Klan slide, it said one of the one of the things coming out of the Klan person was a uh, better schools, right? And some of that, of course, is like the attitudes about Catholic schools at the time, but that's changed certainly. So we we know, and I, I learned a lot from Catherine's books too, um, that not only have some religious people really made an effort or in an organized way to pull their children out of public education, but also have tried to change the curricula in public schools to be able to advance their narrative, their stories, right? But that's changed over time, right? So I wonder maybe Kelly, if you can talk some about like the way it looked in the past and then uh, Catherine too, like why, how it's changed over time and where some of the new fronts are for fighting the harm to public schools. So the Klan very much understood that public schools were the way that you train citizens, that this is your chance to make American citizens into what you want them to be. And that means that you have to pay attention to civics education about how government works and these sorts of things. But it also meant that you had to pay careful attention to the history that people were getting access to. Um, so the Klan had a lot of campaigns to not only get rid of public schools, but also to think about curriculum, right? To make sure that the pledge was happening in public school classrooms, right? Um, to make sure that you're creating those kind of model citizens um, as you want to. Uh, and as someone that has two children in public schools, uh, this is very much still the mode um, that public schools operate in about how kids do the pledge, right? And this has God and country in it. Um, and that this is kind of fundamental to how they start their day, right? And then they have social studies curricula that tells them like, this is how you are a good citizen. Uh, that's nothing about dissent, right? It's all about following leaders and understanding that elected officials have your best interests at heart. Um, so now that we're at home, I get to be like, no, no, this is not the case, right? Like now we're doing civics with mom and anyway, it's a disaster. But um, but the, the American history piece is still there too, um, about like, this is what the nation looked like, right? Which is why we focus on the pilgrims and the Puritans still. And, you know, you have these like silly stories about pilgrims and um, indigenous people sitting down and having a meal. And you're just like, how are we still doing these activities, right? And so this is very much still a part of uh, that history and the curricula piece is really important. So what kind of textbooks are being approved, right? Um, and when you look particularly at white women's activism historically, uh, that um, they're the folks that are in the classrooms. They're the ones who are molding this curriculum. Um, there's this great book called The Mothers of Mass Resistance about this women's activism to do this in education, but also in community, these sorts of things to really fit that narrative of what white supremacy that people want to hold on to. Um, yeah, thanks. I, I wrote, I want to, you know, uh, uh, put in my two cents here. So I um, published a book in 2012 about the uh, a sort of two pronged attack on public education by the religious right. Uh, number one, efforts to force their programming into public schools. And number two, efforts to deflate and, in fact, sort of destroy public education as we know it by siphoning uh, away funding and directing it toward um, uh, private religious schools. And I think it's a real concern, uh, the attack on public education uh, and public schools, which, after all, educate over 90 percent of American school children uh, and really, frankly, deserve our collective support. Um, of course, schools aren't perfect, but... Um, we can work toward improvement without, without seeking to destroy them altogether. But something that I learned as I was researching that book is the attack on public schools has a long, long history. Um, I first uh, found the first reference to the term government schools, which is a sort of coded phrase that a lot of folks sometimes use when they're attacking public schools to a pro-slavery theologian named Robert Louis Dabney, who was very, he was a racist, but he was also very much concerned about the influx of um, Catholic immigrants to America at that time. Let's remember that when Catholics immigrated to America in the sort of 1940s, 
um, uh, and thereabouts. Most public schools taught Protestant doctrine, um, which had become sort of pan-sectarian within the Protestant, you know, large sort of uh, category of Protestant faith. Um, but uh, Catholic schools textbooks were filled with anti-Catholic bigotry, um, terrible stuff they say about the Pope and um, and bishops and the like. And um, Catholic children were prohibited, of course, from reading from their version of the Bible and their texts and things. So native native Protestant, you know, Catholics. Uh, families started to were naturally unhappy with their children being inculcated in anti-Catholic doctrine in their schools and started to sort of push for more representation and Catholic uh, sort of Protestant natives, nativists pushed back and things really came to a head in the 1840s uh, in Philadelphia in two separate incidents people fought and died in the streets and were killed over this issue and I mean we sort of forget the conflicts of our past um, same kind of thing, uh, these conflicts exploded also in Maine, in Boston, in, in Cincinnati. They called them the Cincinnati Bible Wars. And, uh, you know, things came to such a head that actually I want to find this quote for you um, in the Good News Club. Oh, I don't have it in front of me. Um, Ulysses Grant, you know, gave a speech in which he said, you know, um, keep the church and state forever separate. Keep the church and school separate. I'm sort of paraphrasing here. But... The, the point here is that the injection of uh, uh, religious doctrine, you know, sectarian religion in a diverse school is uh, makes it, it is really it, it's incredibly divisive. And it's really not what our public schools are supposed to be about. Um, you know, we don't need to turn our public schools into needless religious battlegrounds. But um, I pulled a couple of resources here because I knew Chrissy was going to talk about public education. I figured it would come up. So here's a little uh, screed by uh, D. James Kennedy, who was a very influential theologian, um, pastor, whose family uh, was supported to, to about at least $5.5 million from the sort of DeVos Prince clan. They were you know, big fans of D. James, James Kennedy. He wrote, um, he talk, he's talking about public schools here. It's called a godly education, sort of contrasting a godly education with what he calls atheistic education, he says, my friends, the anti-Christian bias, the censorship of all things Christian, the infusion of atheistic, immoral, evolutionary, socialistic, anti-American system of education, our public schools has indeed become such that it, if it had been done by an enemy, it would have been considered an act of war. So, you know, the, there's this long-standing hostility to public education. So there's a through line between the anti-public school um, uh, uh, ideas of Robert Louis Dabney and, and those of um, the sort of uh, some of the leaders of the, of the religious right today who are also seeking to destroy public schools. Um, uh, there's a fellow here, uh, uh, Rusas John Rushduni, I'm sure you guys know him, he's a very influential mid-century theologian. Uh, Julie Ingersoll has also written extensively about him and he also called, this is a, it's called The Messianic Character of American Education uh, published in the mid-century. It's just an anti-public school screed. And he calls public education the most appalling engineering, I don't know how to pronounce that word, engineering for the propagation of anti-Christian and atheistic unbelief and of anti-social nihilistic ethics, uh, which the sin-rent world has ever seen. So, you know, Jerry Falwell himself said, um, I think in 19, what was it, like 1989, I hope to see the day when there are no, no more public schools, Christians will have taken them over, no, churches will have taken them over and Christians will be running them. So there is a kind of anti-public school. Here's a great thing about public schools. I mean, I sent my kids to, my, I have, you know, public, we've actually sent our kids, we've done all of it. We've sent them to religious schools. We've sent them to public schools and, and we're currently homeschooling our little one, um, sort of pandemic situation. But the great thing about public schools is they teach kids how to get along with others, including kids who are different, you know. And I think that's one of the reasons why some religious right leaders are so hostile to them. Because a lot of it has to do with uh, keeping people away from other people who aren't like them. Mm -hmm. I see our time is close. 
And I had another juicy question or two. There have been some great questions and comments from the chat, but we don't have time to tackle it. So I'm going to work with my colleagues to schedule some future panels and discussions to drill into some of these topics more. What the, the big one I wrote down that we didn't get to drill into more was a uh, voter suppression and gerrymandering. <laughs> Because I don't think a lot of the media narratives that I see are connecting it to some of the things that you just talked about. But that's for another day now. Uh, do you have any final last short thoughts that you'd like to share before we wrap up the panel? And thank you again for your contributions. No, no, we said, said so much. All right, well, what I'll do is... um. I know some people have talked about your books in the chat. I'll make sure that we share some links and information so that people can look up your books further and your writing. So I'll share your speaker bios too, that link to some of the places that you've written. Um, so people can learn more about this very important and clearly terrifying subject that there's so much work to do on. And I wanna thank, thank you all again for participating in this. Thank you for the work you do. I really look forward to seeing more from you in the future and, uh, and working with you together on this to try to turn the tide, as they say. Thank you all. Thanks, Debbie. And thanks, thanks to all of you. It was great. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thanks, everyone. And thank you, Debbie, for organizing this. This was lovely. Really glad to have you participate. Thanks. <laughs>